morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, today's scripture reading will be 1 Peter 3, 8 through 22. Please stand for the reading of God's word. <clears throat> I got a lot to read, so hang with me. Finally, all of you should be of one mind. Sympathize with each other. Love each other as brothers and sisters. Be tender-hearted and keep a humble attitude. Don't repay evil for evil. Don't retaliate with insults when people insult you. Instead, pay them back with a blessing. That is what God has called you to do, and he will grant you his blessing. For the scriptures say, if you want to enjoy life and see many happy days, keep your tongue from speaking evil and your lips from telling lies. Turn away from evil and do good. Search for peace and work to maintain it. The eyes of the Lord watch over those who do right, and his ears are open to their prayers. But the Lord turns his face against those who do evil. Now, who will want to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you suffer for doing what is right, God will reward you for it. So don't worry or be afraid of their threats. Instead, you must worship God, uh, Christ as Lord of your life. And if someone asks about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. But do this in a gentle and respectful way. Keep your conscience clear. Then if people speak against you, they will be ashamed when they see what a good life you live because you belong to Christ. Remember, it is better to suffer for doing good if that is what God wants than to suffer for doing wrong. You may be seated. Well, good morning to you, and it's a pleasure to be with you. Um, I uh, also brought my son with me, who actually helped me drive. So his, Pat his, name, his name is Patrick, and he's somewhere in the building. So, over the years, um, I practiced a lot of hours of emergency medicine. So, um, uh, I was talking to Sam, I believe, Samuel. He said, "So you've seen things." It reminded me from that a moment, that clip from Night at the Museum where he's wrestling with the night guard and he says, I've seen things. And he goes, what have you seen? So I could tell you many things I've seen, all of which would probably make you vomit, so we're not going to do that. <laughs> but I do want to tell you of one incident. That incident was, uh, I was um, the director of the emergency department and somebody called me. It was a nurse who wanted to finish her nurse practitioner training and rotate uh, with me in the emergency department. And she said these famous words, you know, you're my last rotation and no one else, I can't find anywhere else to go, it's you or nothing. So she guilted me into it. Now, this lady was, uh, I knew her before, I'd worked with her before, now she's in her master's program, and she's just a big personality. She had big hair, she had a big voice, she had a big person, and, and she was just not my favorite person. And I'll never forget, I was very business one day, mostly because I was irritated, and I went to see a patient, and I was very curt. And I was in, I was out, I was done. And we walked out in the hallway, and this particular student, a nurse practitioner, says, Dr. Pross, you haven't changed a bit. And I was stunned. I was stunned because I knew exactly what she meant. That I was just as fleshly as she knew me five years ago as she knew me today. And I was cut to the heart. That's kind of what this passage is going to do to you. This passage in 1 Peter 3, 8 through 22 is a bit long, and we may not finish all of it. I'm sorry about that. But I want you to know that it'll have a way of identifying whether he is Lord of your life or not. You see, as students, you are, are um, well-versed in what it means to be uh, academically oriented, you know very well the, the, uh, the um, uh, agony, uh, great blood, sweaty tears as you finish your assignments to be submitted at 8.59 when they're due at 9 o'clock. I understand that. But, you know, if you leave here and you miss this one very important thing, that it's not just about what you know, it's about who and how you know him, then you would have failed. It's a lot of work just to fail, isn't it? You see, the scripture says, I, if you love me, 
you'll keep my commandments. Not if you love me, you'll know my stuff really well. If you love me, you'll obey me. Now, in this passage today, its roots, its background, its context, and I, I'm, I was going to use my slides, but actually it would be an hour message, and you don't have an hour, so I'm going to have to just go off, off, off grid. But uh, anyway, if you go back to the context, you'll find that the Lord Jesus was the featured person of chapter 2, and it began with this whole idea of, now servants, you, you, you want to honor those even if you're treated roughly, and the Lord Jesus did this, and he did it in, in his own life, as you should treat government officials. He did it in his own life, where he was treated uh, obtusely and roughly and difficultly, and so he, he committed himself to him who judges righteously. That's at the end of chapter 2, and you almost have have like the pivotal verse of the attitude of the Savior as it pertains to suffering, as it pertains to who will be Lord over him, who, who are the person to whom he will submit. And that's our example. And then it goes into the first part of chapter 3, and it uses marriage as an example of that. If you have a husband who's a disobedient to the word, you, by not speaking a word, will win him to the word. It's a play on words, Right? And so what he is saying is he's building this to a crescendo, to a moment when it'll climax in this particular passage, and he addresses everyone. And he says, now, everyone, you need to have a certain, um, how do we say, atmosphere, a certain sort of, of normality about your community. Now, let's go to the text. We'll have today four points, if we can make it. They are... Practicality. Practicality. The second point will be priority. It will be a, the priority Christ has set or the commands that we've been given. The, fourth point, or the third point is paradigm. Paradigm. There is a certain sort of model that we should follow. And then, of course, purpose. I worked real hard to get all four P's, so I'm going to repeat them again. Pra uh, practicality, priority, paradigm, and purpose, and that will be on the test, which I will never grade. Okay. <laughs> let's move forward, all right? Now, if you have your text, let's go back to the scriptures. I'll read the paragraph that is uh, in question for us, and it goes like this. Finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another. Love as brothers, be tender-hearted, be courteous, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you were called to this. And so you should say, called to what? We'll answer that in a second. That you may inherit a blessing. So stop right there. If you notice, there are about five adjectives that are used to describe what the community of believers is supposed to look like, especially as it pertains to the Lord being Lord of your life. For example, he says, oops, let me advance ahead here. He says, all of you be of one mind, harmoniously agreed. That is, there is a, a union of, of, of heart intellect, and perhaps even emotion. There is a, a singularity to you. Number two, there should be a sympathy to you with, with, with a person understanding the plight of another. I am not naturally a sympathetic person. You know, you come to me, your arm's crooked. I said, well, get it fixed. Don't worry about it. My wife, she'd be in tears uh, uh, dabbing their forehead. I'd say, just suck it up. We're going to be fine, okay? different kind of approaches. I need to work on that. Sympathetic, kind-hearted, tender-hearted. I'm not easily touched. I think you have to be as an emergency medicine guy because if you're touched too easily, you can't actually see a patient. You're weeping all the time. So I'm not easily touched. I have to be easily touched. This is the kind of atmosphere that he wants us in a practical way to demonstrate one to another. A humbleness, a, a thinking low of yourself. That's the point. And, and I have to tell you that of all the things in life that's hard to do, it's to think low of myself, that I actually value you as having greater value than me. Do you know who said that? Paul, Philippians chapter 2, that do not think of your own, uh, do not look out for your own interests, but the interests of others. Let, let yourself value the other person of having, as having greater value than you. Do you know where that's the hardest to do? With your colleagues and peers, Right? I mean, you think you're just as smart as them, and then they think they're just as smart as you. 
and it becomes this sort of game of wits. How do I know this? It's exactly like it was when I was trying to do all that research in medicine and had to publish papers and all that kind of stuff. And I thought I was just as smart as that knucklehead who's given the lecture. In fact, I think I could give the lecture better. All that kind of disposition. You know, that is not typical of what it means to have the Lord as the Lord of your life. When you are going through that suffering element, it exposes these things, and this is exactly what he's, tell, what he's trying to communicate. You, need, you and I need to have this atmosphere about us. And then there's uh, several verbs, not returning, uh, payback, uh, reviling, insult for insult. I grew up in an era, which maybe Mr. Boom can, I can connect on, when we were great trash talkers. We were really good. I mean, we could just let it go. You should, you should watch the old reruns of Welcome Back, Cotter. That was our era, okay? I dated myself just now, but you should watch it, YouTube it or something. And you would see what it was like to go back and forth, back and forth, and we, even if it hurt, that was okay. Was it now? Was it? I don't think so, all right? And instead of having that sort of uh, uh, reviling and this uh, idea of returning evil for evil, insult for insult, abuse for abuse, what he says is instead do something totally out of the norm. Return a blessing instead. The idea of speaking well of a person, of speaking with kindness of a person or of a situation. I don't know about you, but I have a PhD in whining and complaining. Do you? I am really good at it. And that's so subtle. You'll never know it's coming, but I am so good at it. And you know what the Lord says? You know, listen, this is not me being Lord of your life. And I want you to look at yourself for a minute. You're around your friends, you're around your, your classmates, you're, you're around people in your similar degrees, and you'll miss the, the rough edges if you don't stop in the mirror and look closely at yourself. For if you come through the course of study here at Emmaus and you finish and everything's happy and you're at graduation and you're getting that diploma, you're getting that, that uh, reward, if you will, and you're not any more like Christ than when you started, you failed. You failed. Our goal is to be like the Savior. It is a predetermined goal of God. All right, we must move on. Time is running out on us. So I'd like you to just briefly read back in the text. Let's go back to the passage again. And I'd like you to see, oops, that's not what I wanted. I'd like you to see this text right here. For he who would love life and see good days, let, his, let him reframe his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him Turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. It's really heavily loaded with verbs. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. His ears are open to their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Now, the thing I want you to notice out of this little secondary paragraph of the main point, practicality, is this. Do you want a long life? You gotta do a few things. I had a patient come in once. He, said, he was funny. He goes, Doctor, how do I live a long life? I, I worked in sort of a farming community. How do I live a long life? I'd like a long life. I didn't know long had two syllables, but it does. He goes, I need a long life. And I said, well, that's easy. And I got out my prescription pad, and I wrote, honor your father and mother. Right? Ephesians 6, 1 through 3. And this one. You want a long life? This is how it happens. I gave it to him. He said, doctor, that's not exactly the pill I was looking for. I said, but it's better than a pill, right? You see, what he's doing is he's saying this. The, the, the atmosphere where Christ rules over our community, our body life, is such that he will reward you with those things which you wouldn't expect. And one of those things you wouldn't expect is this idea of a, continuous, uh, a, a, a continuation, if you will, of life. And how is it done? The emphasis isn't on the reward. The emphasis is on the idea of holding back that tongue, bringing it under control so that whatever is in the heart doesn't come out. That is something else. Someone else is actually controlling you. It's the Lord Jesus Christ through his spirit who has full, who has full authority over even your words. Do you ever go through life and, and, and you come across a situation, usually it's while we're driving, and somebody cuts you off some semi, right? 
they get over from the slow lane to the fast lane and they go slower. That is maddening. And before I know it, my words are just like, what an and you know, exclamation point, hashtag. You see that? I don't want that. Do you? I don't want the absolute nastiness of my soul to be coming out of my mouth. And boy, it happens so quick. Gossip, anger, pride, self-centeredness. You name it, it's there. Practicality, this is what he means. All right, I must move on. I want you to go and look at the point, the second point, which was priority. I'm gonna read this paragraph, okay? And I'm sorry I'm not going into great detail, although I'd love to. The priority uh, uh, paragraph is verses 13 through 17. And who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? Let me make sure I'm correct in my notes because something doesn't sound right. Come on, work with me, baby. Work with me. It's not, there it is. Hmm. Yes, verse 10. Sorry. We'll go back to that. All right, it goes like this. For he would love life and see good as he let his tongue refrain from, uh, this is what I meant to say, his tongue refrain from evil. All those are commands, by the way. So that's your priority, isn't it? All, reframing from uh, seek, not seeking to seek, turning, all those are commands. Seek peace, seek, seek and pursue it. All those are commands. We are given a priority of what to pursue. Now, why do I say that? Because I think most of us treat Christianity like it's optional. I'm pretty sure chapel is not optional for you. You probably have to have so many logged in, right, for the year. I'm pretty sure that's the case. But if you didn't have that requirement, would you be here? Well, I'd hope you'd all be here today. That would be better. But, but you see, we treat Christianity as if it's one of those things that I'll do if I want to and when I'm moved and I'm in the right way. I don't think God does it like that. The, the Lordship of Jesus Christ is never meant to be sort of done at your whim. The Lordship of Jesus Christ is meant to be done 24-7 every moment of every hour of every breath you take. And part of the great dilemma in our day is not so much that we don't know the Word of God. It's that we don't do the Word of God, and thus we're labeled, appropriately so, as a hypocrite. I think we need Christians, hypocrite, anonymous society. You ever been to an AA meeting? In my training, I had to go. We all sit in a circle. My name is Steve Price. I'm a recovering hypocrite. I have not drank from the wine of hypocrisy for the last 32 seconds. Right? No, 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 listen, listen. The priority that we have is its commands. All right, so practicality, priority, let's go to purpose. That's where I was headed, verses 13 through 17. And who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? Notice the rhetorical question. And notice also it's a, it's a conditional sentence, right? So, you know, you have these, what is it, four classes or so of conditional sentences in the original language? Well, this is one of them, all right? And who is he who will harm you if you become followers what of good? If you're, if you're interested, the protasis is the if part, the ad, the Ad, ad, adiposis, I never say that correctly, is the first part. And even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you are blessed. And do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled, but sanctify the Lord God. You see that? You see what I said at the beginning? This is about Christ being Lord of your soul. And there it is, right in the middle of our section. Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Now, I'm going to stop right there because I need to elaborate on some of that. Now, when we talk about this idea of, of, uh, of the paradigm, I mentioned to you that there is this, this rhetorical question, but it's an if-then statement. And this particular if-then statement ha uh, has the idea that the protasis, the first part, is going to probably happen. So if you become a follower, which you most likely will, become a follower of what is good, right? Who is there? He asked now the rhetorical question. Who is going to hurt you? 
You know what he's saying? He's, he's going to cover it in the rest of the paragraph. He's saying, don't you get it? If you do what is right, the one who holds title to righteousness is actually your protector. His eyes are watching for your prayers, and, his eye, and he stands against those who do evil. That's the last half of the paragraph. So he asks this rhetorical question and almost uh, buttresses it with an a, a, a answer that reflects on the watchful eye of God. So he says, listen, if you do what is right, if you respond in the right way, if you do what's in the first paragraph with the right sense of the commands of God upon your life, you will find that there will be that protection. No one it will be allowed, if you will, to harm you. Now, don't get me wrong. You're going to suffer. That's the whole context of the book. But the Savior will protect you. In my life, I've been litigated now three times. If you've ever been litigated in a malpractice lawsuit, you want to kill yourself. It is the most absolute stripping away of everything that you are. I was recently served another lawsuit. Had nothing to do with medicine. It was a totally false claim. And I tell you, I was so tempted to do the wrong thing. Blast this person make their lives a living nightmare. But I needed to do what is right, not what is fleshly. And you know what it takes to do that? It takes a confidence, a faith in God that the judge of all the earth will do what's right. I'm pretty sure in your lives you will come across things in which you, that happened to you which you did not deserve. You were doing the right thing, and you are labeled with some sort of title, some disparaging comment, some rumor. And at that moment, you will be tempted to take matters into your own hands. And I want to, I want to remind you of the text. This is what it says. Sanctify, set apart, make it consecrated thinking that the Lord God will be ruler of everything that is a response from you. See, there's three things, right? There's responses in which you use your cognitive skills to determine and calculate what you do. Then we have reactions, those things which you don't think about, but they come from those previous cognitive think, uh, uh, pathways that you've established. And then you have reflexes. Reflexes are the things you don't think about. They are so well practiced, they come naturally without any thought to the uh, cerebral cortex of your brain. And I want all three of those to be wrapped up under the authority of the Lord God so that he has control of my mind, my will, and my emotions. And that's what this is about. And when you suffer, guess what it does? It's like taking the blankets off the bed and pulling them back and seeing what's really there. So I've had, night, I've had dreams of what I would like to do with this third person who's wanted to, 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 to litigate me, you know, like, Terrible things, forget the morphine when their leg is broken, something like that, you know. That, that, that's the thoughts, that's the thing. And I remember praying and asking the Lord, Lord, I have this situation, I've been doing what's right. And, 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 and he says, don't be afraid of it. That's what it says in verse 14. Don't be afraid of their threats, don't be troubled. It's not what, it's, it's, this is not what it's about. Now that's a quote, I failed to mention earlier the quote was from Psalm 34. This is a quote from Isaiah 8. And Isaiah 8 was, is where the Lord is having this personal conversation with Isaiah. And he says, now Isaiah, when you're out and about, you're going to hear all these conspiracy theories and you're going to hear all these threats of people coming, nations coming in, and all that stuff. Don't believe it. Don't believe it. You would be fearing the wrong thing. You need to not be afraid. Trust me. That's, that's what he's saying and by quoting that text. He says, sanctify the Lord God in your heart so that you might give that answer. You might give that defense, and yes, it has a legal term connotation, something you'd use in the court of law, so that you might give a logical, sequential, rational argument for why you do what you do. And when you do it, you do it with meekness and fear. Now, wait a minute. What is meekness? All right. Meekness is actually well-defined for you from the book of Psalms 37. And in that book, in that little poem, you have this, this, this bad thing happening, and, and you could react, and you know what he says? Trust in the Lord, dwell in the land, cultivate faithfulness. 
And then it goes on about the wicked and how the wicked are doing that and doing this and making your life miserable. And you know what it says? Trust in the Lord for the meek will inherit the earth. That means you've got a solid confidence that God will rectify the situation. You can stand, you can afford to stand down because you trust the person behind you to make it right. Now, that's exactly the language of Genesis 18. Shall not the judge of all the earth do what's right? And the answer to that is he will. And he will do that in your life. And he will do that in these suffering episodes. And he will do that when you're being treated wrong and when you're being abused and when you're being uh, gossiped and your, 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 your reputation is being mar, uh, uh, marred, you see. You can trust in the Lord that way and he will see you through. Right? Now, I want you to notice also that he says good conscience. Good conscience. There's a part of the human soul which is not mind, will, and our emotions. It's just this thing called conscience. And it comes to you from Romans chapter two, where the, the word of God was sort of engraved on your heart so you have a sense of what is right and what is wrong without you actually having to be taught. That's the conscience. And if you don't do what's right, the conscience screams at you. And if you do what's wrong, the conscience screams at you. Uh, it, you, you shouldn't get your theology from Emperor's New Group, but you know the one thing on this, of Kronk's shoulder and the other on the other side, you know, whispering, hey, what about that? Hey, I don't think you should, you know, that kind of thing, right? You remember that movie? Does anybody seen that movie? Yeah, yeah, all-time favorite right here. Okay, but going back to where we were, that conscience, okay? And he says that conscience is really from God, and he says what I want you to do is not let that conscience scream in your ear that you're doing the wrong thing, that you have the wrong motives and you have the, the wrong priorities. I want you to do what's right from the inside out. Mm. That's pretty motivating, isn't it? So... Is he Lord or is he not? You see where he's going with this, right? He's, he's, is he Lord in your community relations? Is he Lord and you following my commands? Is he Lord internally so that the very recesses of the soul where no one sees will actually obey God when no one's looking? Do you know what we call that? The fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is a 24-7 God consciousness that will, that will hold him in the highest regard with the greatest adoration so that there'll be some things that you do and some things that you don't do so that when no one is looking, you will still do the right thing. We have a severe anemia today in the church of God and it's anemia of the fear of the Lord. That's why we have no strength. That's why we have failure. And that's why we must obey. All right, I have just no more time. All right, quickly. That's funny, right? The speaker always says, oh, we have more time. We're going to do one more thing, okay? All right, this is it. We'll read it real quick. Verse 18. For Christ also suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring uh, us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. All right, what does that mean? He's summarizing the work of Christ. Notice the work of Christ is repetitively interwoven, back, beginning in, in chapter 2, and inter, uh, being interwoven in each paragraph th- since. And now he summarizes basically the whole plan of the gospel, like a 1 Corinthians 15 summary. Suffered for our sins the just for the unjust, the categorically innocent taking, uh, uh, taking the place of the categorically guilty. And you know, you had the six trials to really show to all, any reader that Jesus was absolutely innocent. Even the Romans could figure that out. Now, what did he do? Well, he did all that to bring us to God. I love that phrase. That was his motivation. He had real purpose in doing the suffering. He had this real purpose in going through the, the agonies of what it means to be God and taking the form of, of a bond servant, right? And you have agonies too, and you will take roles in your life which will have difficulty and pain, and you'll wonder, what am I doing, and why is this happening? And I want you to know someone went before you who did it so well, and his name is Jesus Christ, and he took a path that he's already traveled for your sake. And that path was instrumental to bring you to God. So if you're going through trial and you're suffering, there is purpose. Many of you are unmarried in this room. In 10 years from now, most of you will probably be married. 
and most of you will probably have marital problems. How do I know that? <laughs> you two sinners. <laughs> That's how I know that. <laughs> think about it. If sinner A marries sinner B, what do you think is going to happen? Flesh. Ideas to be transformed into the image of Christ. And when, that, when those things happen, I want you to remember that Christ suffered unjustly also. And you can go around and you can claim your rights and you can say, I'm being this and I'm being that and all that kind of language. Or you can look to the Lord Jesus. That's what you need to do. All right, the last three verses have to do with a kind of a side note. In fact, if you, if you were to structure it out in the New Testament, it is all connected from verses 19 to 22. All right, so I'm going to give you the quick cliff note version because we don't have time to debate it. But this is what I think, all right? That he preached, it says he preached the spirits are in prison. Who are, who are those spirits? That's in the next verse. The spirits who were formerly disobedient. Who was formerly disobedient? Well, it could have been angelic people, angelic individuals, or it could have been people people. I think it was people people. Why? Because it says, it contrasted with eight souls that were saved through water. That's the contrast. That means that had to, the, the ones who were not saved had to be people, like the eight souls who were saved. And therefore, their spirits, because they were unbelievers, they did not follow the warnings of, of Noah, ended up in, if you will, prison. And we can debate what that is in, in the economy of, of, uh, of unseen things. But the bottom line is, they were... They were held, if you will, most likely Hades, right? Now, so it seems like the Lord Jesus was speaking to those spirits, right? How did he do that when they were alive during Noah's day? The only answer is he must have did it through the person of Noah, as if Noah was his representative, right? Pre-death. Now, there are many other theories, and we're not here to debate that. It's going to take, you take that in your Peter class, right? But I, I, I think the, the gist is not so much about well, is this unseen scene, the spirits of the ones who'd gone before Moses or Noah and the Lord Jesus? What, what, I don't think that's the issue. The, the real point that he's making is this. He has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God and everything is under his authority. Are you? Are you? That's the question. There's that verse that says, and now baptism now saves, this idea that anti-type, that baptism uh, now saves us, that's in verse 21. And some would say, oh, see, that's like the baptism for the dead. We would call that heretical. But what I think it means is it's, a, it's referring to a spiritual baptism. How do I know that? Because he refers to spiritual intangible entities, conscience and resurrection. So I think he's saying the anti-type is this, baptism, is this baptism stuff that relates back to the flood and specifically not referring to water touching the skin as if removing filth from the flesh, which is in verse 21, but rather this good conscience that's intangible, that's a spiritual thing. Resurrection, that's a spiritual concept which we believe was an actuality. The point is, is that I think he's saying the Spirit of God has raised you from the dead, given you a good conscience. You have been baptized into Christ. Okay. That's the data. All right. Here's what I want you to take from here. Is the Savior Lord of your life or not? The whole thing begins with Jesus submitting to the Father, trusting his decision-making. It needs to happen in servant relationships with masters. It needs to happen with government officials. It needs to happen in marriages, and it needs to happen in your communities. Is he Lord or not? If that's the case, you will look like several features in the first paragraph. The second thing is this. You will have a priority. You will make it your priority to obey him. The third one is this, that you will have a paradigm, a paradigm that you will follow his path, and finally, you will have purpose. My question you today is what's your purpose? The Lord is either Lord and Master, or excuse me, Lord and Teacher, or only Teacher and Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time we've had in the Word of God. We'd like to ask your blessing that you would strengthen the students as well as the classes today and this weekend. We thank you that you've brought so many to come. We pray for your blessing fully upon uh, these events, but also that you would be honored for them all, not just us to receive something, but honor would be given to our great King. In Jesus' name, amen.